This is Vern Denham Grimsley on campus. If you get beat on the head enough, perhaps you stand up and pick up a club yourself. Uh, I, you know, in words, he who turns the other cheek will get hit by the other fist. I think we're in a fairly, fairly relativistic period. It would be nice if violence was not necessary. I mean, you know, they don't have the luxury of, of being nice. It's too late, it seems to me. Much too late. You were talking about changing things, in other words, changing structures economically, politically, sociologically. I think, and this was, of course, the teaching of Jesus, that the most certain way to change things, ultimately, is to change people. And that the beginning of love, compassion, and understanding, when people honestly will dare to believe that ideal, that this planet is a family, that they do have divine dignity and worth, and that consequently, every other human being they see, whatever the color of his skin, black, brown, yellow, or whatever, is likewise of divine dignity, a child of God. But what do you do with a power structure that will not admit this dignity? Uh, you, know, you know, how long do you let them uh, prevent people from feeling like human beings? How long do you let that go on? Well, I'm simply on the basis of principle opposed to the concept of violence as a means of resolution of problems. I think if we have gone this far and learned this many lessons, and if we have been able scientifically and technologically to progress as well as we have, that we ought to be able about now to be able to find better ways of solving our problems than by means of violence. And I think that spiritual power, people daring uncompromisingly to live by high spiritual teachings. This is not an easy path. This is not for the cowards. This is for people who are really willing to say every day, Father, your will be done. Willing, in other words, to be led by divine purposes whatever this may cost, even if it costs their lives. The so-called hippie movement, the entire young generation, what's going on now, have a tremendous emphasis on this one great old spiritual word, which is love. A person finds a new infilling of love, a new ability to love other human beings, in discovering and daring to believe with a profound faith that he's loved by God. For some reason, although this might seem irrelevant just on the intellectual level, on the spiritual level, when you really accept this, that you're loved by God, infinitely, boundlessly valuable, as Jesus said, the hairs of your head being numbered, suddenly there's a new ability to love other people. The feeling of uh, kinship comes from God as being children of God, really. There are not that many instances where no alternative to violence or force is available. And the point is that we've been all too ready and all too quickly willing as a people, as a nation, as a culture to resort to violence, to resort to bloodshed, to thinking of other people as animals instead of as children of God, thinking of them as so much chattel or people in the way instead of as brothers, children of the Father. And that's what I think can make the difference. Well, I really dig it. Do you? I was uh, strongly against it for a long time, but I really dig it now. What brought about this change in your mind? Well, I don't know. It just came about. <laughs> you know, like... The I think, goes? <laughs> no, uh, no vision or anything like that. I just think that really what this cat's saying is really right. I think it's the right way to go about things. You know, I think it's the only way to really maintain yourself as a human being. I mean, really be master of yourself, is to go about things that way. To, to live as a child of God and a yeah, brother of man? To, to, you know, try whatever you can to do the best you can here as a human being. That's the way I feel about it. Very much so, yeah. <laughs> the enthralling and the thrilling thing about it is, though, that man has been given a fragment of infinity to indwell his mind. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. And this task is made possible by the fact that a person can draw upon spiritual energies for the ability to love his fellow human being. That a man is not just left alone to grit his teeth and wrinkle his brow and try to love even though it can't be done somehow, but that he has the spiritual power, if he'll draw on it in prayer and in seeking God's will, he has this power to do it. Yeah, I seemed like uh, about a year ago like I was really opposed to God all the way around, but uh, one day I just took out the Bible and read it a bit and looked at it. A lot of stuff I still don't really agree with, but I do think that, you know, really the ultimate idea about the religion is really good. I think, it's, uh, I think that it's mainly just the fact that, well, it seems to me like I, th I thought a lot about, you know, what you have to be to really be master of yourself. And it seems to me that, you know, the idea of just really, you know, never doing anything to anybody else that you wouldn't want done to yourself really seems to about sum up mostly what's really going on. Now, this self-concept or this self-restraint which is embodied in the scripture that greater is he who masters himself than he who conquers or takes a city? That's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. <coughs> that's where it's at. That's the way I feel about it. I don't know, like, it's really not easy, but, you know, like, I, I think that really, deep down inside, it's the only way. It depends on whether you're really sincere. It seems like a lot of people use it as an excuse or as a crutch to, to help them, you know, but if you're really sincere about it, I think it is. Like, you know, I've been brought up uh, 
as an atheist all my life, and uh, so like I don't think I've been influenced in any way to believe anything because, uh, you know, I have no influence at my home or anywhere else, which you know makes me do so. Like it just this is simply something you came to in your yeah, personal experience. Really, just decided, you know, that like that's where it's at. You know, it's just that's very interesting. I find this happening time and time again. And there's a curious parallel in the life of Helen Keller, who, of course, was blind and deaf. She had not received any formal religious training, but one time they had a minister come and talk to her and tell her about God and the loving Father and all. And afterward, she said, through sign language, I knew, I always knew there was somebody like that, but I just didn't know the name for it. It was just something that came about, you know. Like, yeah. like I'm really still, it's, like, I think God is, like, on my mind practically all the time because I haven't really figured out, you know, what it is exactly. I think, in a sense, God is in man's mind, that his spirit is yeah, there. I think it's basically what it is, too, but I haven't really, you know, diagnosed the whole thing, clearly, completely. I think it'll probably be on my mind as long as I live. You know? I think if people are changed by believing themselves to be children of God, and this is an act of faith, after all, it doesn't just happen, it's not something you're born with, as you say, it's something you come to, but if a person makes this decision, then it's able to change his life and, consequently, to change the world. Not too long ago, over in London, England, they were digging around in a field someplace and found a World War II bomb which had been dropped by the German Nazis and inside it when they called the British bomb demolition or detection squad to disarm this thing they found instead of blasting powder or some kind of explosive they found perfume and the authorities in London are still attempting to ascertain exactly why this is but in a sense this symbolizes to me the choice that mankind has before us are we going to throw perfume at each other or are we going to throw bombs are we going to be violent or are we going to be loving are we going to be a family and children of one father or are we going to treat each other as alienated um no I, I, I certainly agree that uh, God is a personal God and that uh, he loves us uh, there's a couple of things that you know that you've said I I'm not sure if I'm interpreting you rightly or not, but uh, when you talk about Jesus... Go ahead and interpret me wrongly and we'll discuss it. <laughs> when you talk about Jesus, uh, you seem, you know, almost to talk about him, you know, as though he were a preacher that lived a long time ago and, uh, you know, is dead. Oh, in no sense, by simply quoting a lot from what Jesus said, am I attempting to imply that I think <laughs> that's all he was, just a spouter of platitudes and pleasing proverbs and homilies for the day back in Palestine 2,000 years ago. No, I very much think that Jesus, the human name Jesus, Joshua, meaning Savior, Christ the Christos in Greek meaning the Anointed One, is a living Christ, yes. I very definitely think so. But when I talk about the teachings of Jesus, I am not attempting to say these were just the dead words recorded on some crusty parchments years ago of some man who had a few good ideas and we still have the record of them today. I think that these are still crucially relevant because in those teachings Jesus expresses some basic truths about, for example, God's love for man. And I talk to students here on this Berkeley campus for whom that is probably the most important major question they face. Are they living in a friendly universe? Are they loved? Are they worth anything? And I say man is infinitely valuable to God. As Jesus said, the hairs of our heads are known and not a sparrow flutters to the ground without God's knowledge. I'd, I'd say that's true. Whereas if a person knows that he's a child of God and infinitely loved, he's not trying to prove anything to himself or anybody else then. He's living authentically with real liberty. That's really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think God does know all about his children. Jesus said God knows every hair on everybody's head. How does that strike you? Well, all right. I don't know what the theology of toupees is or... Uh, I said, give me a haircut. What'd you say? It depends how you put your hair up or down or in the hippie way or everywhere. <laughs> That's the, it depends on that. Well, we could strike an easier one. I think God knows every cell and every molecule in every person's body. I think that God is an infinite mind and he is also a loving father and all people are children of God. I've got a question. What'd you say? I said, I have a question. I have an answer. Which answer would you like to get? Would you like to hear the answer first? <laughs> <laughs> Why is the fatherhood of God a necessary prerequisite for the brotherhood of man? Well, let's look at it as an analogy here on earth. Have you ever seen brothers without a father? I've seen people who treat each other as if they were brothers, in fact, better than... That's the very point, because this planet is the family of God, I think, and all people are brothers. But it's because we have not recognized, really, this fatherhood of God, have not drawn upon the spiritual energy available to us that we are not living as this family of God with this spiritual transformation in individual lives. Great German proverb, blessed are the homesick for they will come home. And I think that's the way it is in finding God. A person has this homesickness for the universal father and 
in finding God, he has a resolution and a satisfaction of it. If you seek, you'll find, knock, and the door will be opened, and ask, and it will be given, spiritually, huh? Yeah, you really have to hide very hard to get away from God. You have to put up all kinds of barriers to keep away from Him. I mean, that's my experience. I've tried hard to get away from Him. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That, that that's a, Eradicating some of the hatred is an important task, too. But given the fact that there, there are people hating you, that if you're an Israeli, there are people trying to push you into the sea, you've got to decide what you're going to do. And it is, it's more than just a political, a political dilemma. It's a moral dilemma, too. And, and, I, and I don't know what your philosophy suggests for these people. And, and there ought to be something that you could suggest. I can only suggest that a person think of his fellow man as a brother, whether that person be Israeli, Jewish, whether he be black in the south, whether he be white in the north, whether he be yellow in the east or whatever. This method of individual change by spiritual growth can change the world. Perhaps that's the start anyway. Thank you. I sort of think it's in a way a brainwashing thing. Where, uh, religion brainwashes a person? Right, I think when you go to church... The better to have clean minds. Uh, <laughs> You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed...